Good morning. Good morning. And welcome on this wonderful, beautiful day outside. It's a wonderful day to be able to be in the house of the Lord. We have some folks that are out and about uh, vacationing and whatnot, but those of us are here are here to enjoy what God has for us. And if you're worshiping with us online, I want to wish you a very special welcome. We know that uh, if you could be, you'd be here. And so it's exciting to know that uh, we're, you know, God is going out all over the place and even overseas. Uh, every so often people uh, check in and say that they're watching our service together. So it's, no, it's fun to know that God's word is indeed being spread all over the place. But we don't have a whole lot going on this week, but uh, we do have uh, a note from the Green Nazarene Church. They're having a VBS, if you know of anybody that is looking for a place to put their kids for VBS this year. On June 24 to 28, the Green Nazarene is going to be having a VBS called Stellar. Jesus Light Shine looks like an outer space type thing. So uh, they over Green Nazarene on June 24 to 28, they will be having a VBS. Other than, uh, and I was going to uh, really wish uh, one gal a special day because a lot of us were over at the square yesterday to celebrate Betty's 90th. That's coming up on Wednesday and a couple other birthdays as well. But other than that, I don't know a whole lot of other announcements this morning. Does anybody have any that need to be shared this morning? Well, if not, uh, how would you describe God? If you had to describe God, what are some of the attributes that you would give to God? And how would you describe Him? Well, if you turn your hymn notes to hymn number 626, you have just a, a couple there uh, that talk about who God is. Hymn number 626, He is the lily of the valley, He's a bright morning star. Let's stand together and praise Him as we begin our service this morning and worship Him together, shall we? I found a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse is make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, he's my stay. Unto to him to roll. He's the lily of the valley. All my grief have taken and all my sorrow born. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have hope for him forsaken and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me sore, through you, Jesus I shall safely reach the Four days. 
and you only got up with help. Oh yeah, right. So she's she's still strong, she sounds great, but she's finding a new aspect of this whole mess, and nobody quite knows why. But it's better than it was. And I didn't have a chance to tell you all about it because it got kind of hairy with the whole situation. But anyway, I know you've been praying for her, so thank you for that. Amen. Anyone else? Well, Becky got down to uh, uh, Daytona last Wednesday and is enjoying the sun and uh, the wind and the waves and the smell of the salt air and the sand in her toes. So I'm sure she's praising the Lord wherever she's at. She's all by herself. Well, actually, my daughter is with her more often. Uh, yeah, Heather's been with her quite a bit. But she's not going to have to deal with us, too. True. Anyone else? Well, there's some prayer requests then. Anything you need to bring before the Lord this morning? Joy? Susan has a situation at work. Situations at work. I don't know all the details, but <coughs> on top of that hour driving away, it sometimes gets to her. But she's done with classes, so sometime early fall. So she's still working on the doctor. So, Susan? I was going to say, for the Christians overseas, um, protection and provision for fellowship. It matters. Okay. Anyone else? Julie? They're signing on our house Thursday. So, things seem to go wrong for us at the very last minute, so I'm just asking that you pray it all goes smoothly. So they're supposed to sign Thursday, and we have to be out by June 12th. So pray for that, too. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. All those traveling this week and beyond. are traveling as well, and a few others in our midst. Any others? Yes? Last week of school, so I just pray that everything goes smoothly, because people still run them reds, and, you know, it's just a little crazy out there. Just, just we keep the kids in prayer, because they, you know. Consider God as a friend of yours. How about Jesus? You know, it's such a comfort to know that, you know, we talk about each other. You and I are our, our buddies. We're, we're friends. But to think about God who is, you know, he's God. And what a friend we have in Jesus. That all these things that we are concerned, we can bring to him. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Let's uh, stand together as we thank him for that precious thought that he is indeed our friend.
so from our sins and then eventually bring us home to the Father's love. The truth is, God has always considered that yes, we are worthy in His mind. We may not feel 100% comfortable with that. God knew that we can't rescue ourselves, so He did it Himself. He provided a rescue plan, the sacrifice, and the circumstances make it all happen. In Hebrews 12 we find, let us look only to Jesus. He is the one who began our faith and he makes our faith perfect by allowing his body to be broken out of his love for you and I. Let's eat together. <clears throat> Ephesians 2.13 says, at one time you are far away from God. But now, in Christ Jesus, you are brought near to God through the blood of Christ's death. Because of that, we now have peace. Let's thank God for His peace, shall we? No, 
I, I don't think we are, but in God's eyes, yes, we are. My goodness, that is so awesome. And in thanks to that, how can we not help but not only just give our tithes and offering, because we know we should, but to do it out of a joyful heart. We have such a privilege every week of being able to be a part of God's ministry here. And so let's stand together and thank Him for that privilege of giving to our tithes and offerings this morning. Praise God from all blessings flow. Praise Him all. They packed up all their belongings, they loaded up into a ship and set sail. They sailed for many days until they came to a place where they could start off all over again, practice their religion the way they wanted to, because you see, they were Bible-believing Christians, and they came from a place where the religion there was do it my way or else, it was all works-oriented, and they knew that the Bible says that we can't work our way. To heaven. And in their new country, things were progressing along rather nicely until the old king decided that he wanted to still have some contact with them by charging them taxes. Well, this offended them because taxes are used to support a government spending habits. <laughs> and since they had left that country, they were no longer a part of that country. And so they didn't feel the need to continue to support that government, especially when they had their own issues to deal with in this new land. As you can imagine, made the old king a bit ticked off. And he told them, you better either pay up or prepare for war. So the people had a choice to make. And they decided to fight for their right to have religious freedom without being penalized by taxes. When the fight started, it appeared as though the king might win, but then through the, the human spirit that was demonstrated, the king found that he could not kill that human spirit that was seeking freedom, and when things finally settled down, they wrote this document that says, but in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union to establish justice to ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. <laughs> what a paragraph. 
Oh my goodness. Now next week is Memorial Day Sunday. Five weeks later is going to be our celebration, our patriotic celebration. But today we're going to be looking at the first two verses of Philippians chapter 2. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to Philippians 2 as you are wondering to yourself, what in the world is pastor doing here? How do these two things go together? From well, the document I just read, we find a group of people who came together in agreement. They were focused on one common goal. And when you read this document, they're in reference to the unity to which they were taking their stand. The writers of this document used the word people. It was not an individual that was taking a stand against the king, but a whole group of people. The term here, we the people, demonstrate a unity, a coming together of a group of separate individuals who are united with one great goal. And when these people decided that enough was enough and they wanted to separate themselves from the king, they came into an agreement and they chose their course of action. When I think about how this country was started, I wonder sometimes, where would we be today if these individuals did not take that stand? If just half of them decided, well, you know, I think we're going to bow down to that king. And they held up their hands and they surrendered never to take the stance again. Let me tell you what would have happened. We would still be ruled by, uh, by England today. We should all give praises that uh, they did not give up because of their dream for freedom and their dream to be able to worship God in the way that they wanted to worship God and felt that God wanted them to worship. So this morning, as your minds may be reflecting a little bit on that little tidbit of history, I want to talk with you about the agreement that you and I need to have. Do you feel that you need to be in agreement with God? Do you? Do you feel that you need to be in agreement with God? Now, uh, several of you are nodding your head, thank you. Some of you are going, what's he getting at? I think the what's he getting at, well, yeah, of course we do. <laughs> but then, does that mean that when his word says something, that we should be in agreement with it? You can nod your head, yes. We need to be in agreement with God. And there are so many places in this book where it talks about being in unity with each other. How many verses have come across our path in the, just in the last couple of years that talk about being in unity with each other? Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he prayed that great prayer, he said he prayed that you and I would be in unity with each other and with God. So how many of you here know that one plus one equals one? <laughs> Come here and say no. Now I consider myself pretty good at basic math. When we play hand and foot, I am usually the scorekeeper and I can pretty much instantaneously add stuff up pretty quickly. And I'm talking about adding, subtracting, and multiplication, and the division. Now, I'm not talking about calculus or that new math. I don't know anything about new math. But in the old-fashioned math, one plus one equals two. two. But this morning, one plus one equals one. When you look up the word agree, you'll find this definition. To be in accord to be of the same opinion, to arrive at an understanding. And the definition of agreement is to be like-minded between people as it pertains to marriage. When two individuals decide that they want to get married, before they say, I do, in the eyes of God, man, they're still two separate individuals. They cease to be two, but one when they come together in marriage. When they come into agreement with each other, they cease to be two, but one. And Paul says that they become that one new person, able to accomplish twice as much together as they ever could have apart. Now, if two people come
coming together in marriage can accomplish twice as much together as they ever could apart. Think about how much 30 of us together can accomplish together than we ever could have apart. And now you add God to the mix. How much can we accomplish when we are working in unity with one another? Take a look at what Paul says here in the first two verses of Philippians chapter 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort of his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. When Paul evaluated everything that he had been through, he encouraged the brethren here and cistern by being of, of one mind in love, united in spirit and intent, one purpose, in agreement with each other. And Paul knew that for this church to be able to move forward and have a force in this world, that they had to be in agreement. They had to have one purpose. Seeing the brethren come into agreement with each other was very important to Paul. A couple of years ago in the book of Colossians, we saw that one of Satan's greatest ploys over the years has been to try to create division within the church because he knows that if he can get those within the church to be at odds with each other, to be at each other's throats, not only can he keep the church from doing all that God needs to be done, but then those outside the church will want nothing to do with those that are inside the church when they see the way that those in the church are treating each other. So how many of you have ever said something derogatory about someone else in this church to somebody else outside this church? Paul uses this word if four times in these verses. He says, if there is any encouragement of Christ. Have you ever been encouraged by Christ or by people right here in our midst? He says, if there is any comfort of his love. Have any of you ever been comforted by God's love or by the love shown by the people here in this church? If there is any fellowship of the Spirit, have any of you ever enjoyed fellowship together? Especially at 9.15 on Sunday mornings, downstairs, or fellowship with God. If there's any affection and compassion, have any of you ever experienced God's compassion, God's love, or perhaps the love and compassion from each other right here, from God's people? What he's saying here is that if these things are present in regards to you experiencing it, then as a brother or sister, you need to show the same thing to those around you. And not only that, but Paul is also saying that his joy is not going to be complete yet, even if you have some of these things going on. But for his joy to be complete, he says that you need to be of the same mind. You need to maintain the same love. United in spirit, intent on one purpose. In other words, because of the investment that he had in these people, that his joy would be complete when they were showing love and unity towards each other in the body. So, how do you come into an agreement? What would it take to come into agreement with someone else? Kind of sounds easy, so to speak. You sit down and you talk, you finally agree on something. I wish it was that easy. <laughs> Look at verses 3 and 4 in the first part of 5. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility of mind consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. First thing that has to be done in order for us 
to reach full unity and full agreement in, in the spirit is to put away selfishness. Consider the example of two people coming together to a negotiations table. When two people come to a negotiations meeting, both individuals have agendas by which they're going to be operating. Each of them have things that they want, things that they're willing to give up if they have to, in order to get what they want. The goal of negotiations is to get as much as you can by giving up as little as you can. And so in the world, a lot of times we come to the negotiations table with selfish motives. Doing our best to get what pleases us rather than what is best for the whole group. Paul tells us when we come into an agreement, we need to be focusing on things that God wants to be done. We need to put aside our own agendas, our own selfishness, for the good of the whole community, of the Christian community. It does not matter if my suggestion is taken or if it is rejected. As long as we are moving forward with God in the right direction. But we need to be totally open as to where the Spirit leads us. Although I may think I have the right answer, I need to be open to the Spirit for confirmation, being willing to back down if I need to. When we put aside our selfishness and our own agendas, we then open ourselves up to God to be led in the right direction. And this is the starting point for coming into agreement. Next thing Paul says in the same verse is, but with humility of mind. Now that, that's not easy for some folks. Easier for some than others. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Hmm. First of all, Paul tells us to set aside our selfishness. And then he tells us how to do it. He says there's no room for self. You know, it's hard to drive your own agenda if you think someone else is more important than you are. Isn't it? Paul is asking that person who has the attitude that says, you know, others need to contribute to the solution, but also know that they are not a threat to me. And when we begin to think of others as greater than ourselves, it becomes a little easier to put aside our own selfishness. It's not easy, but with the Spirit's help, it is often done. Using our own power, we can't do it because of our own self-preservation mode of operating. Verse 5 says, some translation says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. To truly understand the essence of having the mind of Christ, we need to look at the life of Jesus himself. He was a man of humility. He was always putting others first before himself. He was a servant. He was washing the feet of his disciples. He was he, uh, healing the sick. He was feeding the poor. He was a man of love. He was showing compassion to those who were the, the least, the lost, and, and the, 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 the uh, anyway, those who weren't doing too good. Jesus thought of them more than himself. He was a man of compassion. He was a man of sacrifice. And he gave his life for the sins of the world. This is the mind of Christ. A mind that is filled with humility, of service, of love, and sacrifice. Some of us used to wear a little bracelet that had WWJD on it. What's WWJD mean? What Jesus do. Now you might be thinking, oh, that's a bit of a tall order, isn't it? How can I, as a mere mortal, try to have a mind like God the Son, like Christ? And the answer lies in our daily choices. Every day, every week, we are faced with decisions, big and small, that shape our character. We have choices. Do we want to be humble or prideful? Do we choose to serve or to be served? Do we choose to love or to hate or to be angry? Do we choose 
to sacrifice would be selfish. These choices made day in and day out not only shape our mind, but shape our very lives themselves. So the first aspect of coming into agreement of having a mind like Christ is humility. We'll talk about that more after Father's Day. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Now let me say that again for those who are online, can't see the screen up there. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but about thinking of yourself less. It's putting others before yourself, just as Jesus did. He did not cling to his divine status, but he emptied himself. He took upon the form of a servant. He humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross. And that is the kind of humility that he's asking you and I to show. A humility that puts others first, that considers others' needs before our own. Now today's psychobabble says, you need to take care of yourself first. Anybody ever hear that? Anybody ever been told that, well, you need to take care of yourself first? For anyone who's ever believed any of that, and you can put your own term there, <laughs> how does that compare with Jesus? Self-preservation says, well, I've got to take care of myself because no one else will. Let me tell you something. God will. On my job, I've got to let my boss know everything that I'm doing so that I can get credit for it. At home, I need to think of myself first so that I can feel better about things. In church, I've got to be out there in front making sure that I am getting mine. Self-preservation is something that is instilled in each of us at birth. It's natural for us as much as our own face. Because we were born in sin. And that what focus on self is. Sin. Although it's a part of us, it was part of us when we were born. Self-preservation often wars against God, and God is telling us that we need to give up ourselves. No, self-preservation says, well, what will I get in return if I do so? God says, allow me to speak through you to others. Well, self-preservation says, well, in order to succeed, i got to be the spokesperson. i got to give my views across. In order for me to be happy, I need to have my preferences even in church. See my point here? In order for us to take that first step towards agreement with each other, we need to put aside our selfishness, our ambitions, our preconceptions of what I see is the only way and the best way. We need to stop operating in the mode that I need to get mine the way I like it. Because I will only be happy when I get what I like, what I feel rather than looking at what is best for everyone else. And if we can accomplish that, then we can move on to the next step that Paul says we need to do in order to come into agreement. Verse 4 there, he says, Don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Once we put aside our own selfishness and we begin to view others as better than ourselves, then the next thing that will happen is that we begin to look out for the interests of others first. Now the Amplified Bible puts it this way. Let each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not merely your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, it's okay to look out for yourself and your own interests. Don't get me wrong here. But God requires that we need to be, first of all, Concerned about the interests and the concerns of others. And when we come together to agree, 
I need to have your best interests at heart, and I need to consider you as more important than myself. I will be attentive when you are speaking and the issues that you bring forward, and the same thing when you are listening to me or to each other. The way that you respond when I am speaking and bringing my issues forward, then you can bring your issues forward, and then we can come together into an agreement on how we are going to move forward for God. Because of the level of sensitivity that we have for each other. If a person truly has the interests of each other greater at the forefront of their mind, they will be attentive to that person. If you want to know how your attitude is, let me tell you how. Check your responses when you are having a conversation with someone else. If you are constantly interrupting them, then just maybe your agenda is more important than theirs, what they think. If you can't look them in the eye or you are multitasking while they are expressing themselves, or you are thinking about your response to what they are saying, and that is what is more important in your thoughts, when we come in agreement with each other, that's not going to happen. We put them in a higher position in our mind and in our actions, and when we talk with other people, it's more important while we listen to them. This is the attitude we are to have within ourselves. That we esteem others, whoops, <laughs> that we esteem others as greater than ourselves. It is a crucial point in our ability to be able to come together in agreement with each other. Paul said that their attitude needs to have the mind of Christ and we'll look at that more fully when I get back from Daytona in a few weeks here. Jesus made it a point that we need to be reaching out and helping others. It is not about self-preservation. It is not about how I feel. It is not about what you feel like you have gone through. But it is about saving the lives of others. He did whatever he had to to do what God had given him. And this is the attitude that Paul said each one of us need to have within us as well. So this week. I have an assignment for you. Okay, you ready? I know we're not in school, but I have an assignment for you. Even though we're coming this summer, because you're not in school anymore, it doesn't matter if we're in summer or not. I got an assignment for you. I want you to pay close attention to what you are thinking when you have conversations with other people this week. When you do that, think about that. Notice if you are, you know, whether you are paying attention or not. Or just biding your time until you can't wait to share what you are thinking about it. If you find yourself not really giving that person your undivided attention, or thinking more about what you want to get across when they're done talking, quit! Change your mindset real quick! And look at them. And sincerely listen. Lord, thank you for these few verses, and there's so much that we could have unpacked in these verses, even more so than we did. But Lord, we know that your mind is 100%, 200%, all of that. And Lord, we do want to be your ministers. So Lord, fill us with love for each other. Fill us with a unity with the a desire to be in agreement with each other. And Father, I pray that as we come into that agreement that we will be able to see you doing some fantastic things through our midst, even in this small little church, Lord, we know that you have some greater things in mind for this church to do in the future. And so, Father, help us as we come into agreement with each other to be able to see how you can use us in these days ahead. And we'll thank you for it, that you may we pray. Amen. But we know that God loves us, that He cares more for the sparrow. That, well, He cares as much for the sparrow than anything else, but if He cares for the sparrow, then we know that He loves us. So let's stand together this morning as we thank Him and decide that we too are going to share His love with us.
And uh, so folks can enjoy God's great outdoor. And it's kind of nice hearing the birds twerk uh, his eyes on the sparrow as we are meeting out there. So on the first and the third Sundays, including on the third Sunday of June, which happened to be Father's Day. So the Sunday that I get back, we'll be meeting out in the pavilion. And I'm going to take some time for you to talk about Father's Day. So think about that for the next few weeks. Think about memories that you have of your dads. All right? In uh, Romans 15, 5 and 6, we find this. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had. And so that no, and so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have a great week. Have a week of ministering to each other, of even considering others as better than yourself. Amen. Can't wait to see you next week.